I know I love fish. Um, we had a great time for Jonah's um, band concert, and that's why we were uh, not able to go to that, but, but definitely enjoyed that. But you know, as we're talking about prayer requests, I just got to talk about something before we start. If anybody just wants to stand up and say a praise report, what has God done in your life this week or last week? Or you can just sit there and just share it. Well, I just gave my praise. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Gifts and trying to do the last minute things. Nothing wrong with them. As I was thinking about it, I'm leaving out this weekend. I'm like, man, there's a lot of people out here. There's going to be a lot of people stressed out. I'm like, man, God, help me remember you, God, too. But uh, yeah, absolutely. He's been good to us. I know that. I'm going to ask you if we want to come to the altar, if you want to kneel um, where you're at, we're just going to go to the Lord in prayer and just bow, as we already have, praying that God will help us respond in the right way to his birth. And uh, pray for that person that you put in your heart, um, that we're hoping it's going to be a very special service Christmas Eve for you, just a short service, but a very special service too, that you could invite someone that hasn't been here in a while, someone you know. Um, let's pray. Don't leave the altar if you can or you won't. Father, we do thank you for this, this series of praise reports, God. Uh, and, and prayer requests, Lord. But Lord, let's see how you work. And you constantly still want to work. You want to work in every one of our lives. You want to interfere in our lives. And sometimes we don't allow it. I know I don't sometimes. But I need to. To allow you to interfere in my life. And Father, thank you for this church. Thank you for allowing me to be here um, in the midst of here and to, to be able to um, share from my heart what you've laid in my heart, to share with these people. And uh, I've got more blessing than they did have. And I thank you for that, God. Father, we thank you this morning, what you're going to do this morning. We pray for those that are not with us, they're sick. And we pray for the the healing, those colds, those, those coughs. We pray for those that are in a nursing home or in a hospital or have strokes. We pray for those that, that, that are praying for those. But God, that, that, um, we pray for support with them. We pray for those that you will heal them, Lord. We know that you are, you are still in the miracle business of healing. We pray for that. We thank you for the report of one that said, hey, it wasn't what I thought it was. And we know it was what you thought it was, because we know you know all and you're in control. We thank you for that, God. We thank you for this one that we celebrate every Christmas. The birth of your son. How awesome is that, God? To be able to remind ourselves every day, every year, that little baby. I entitled this sermon Responding to His Birth. And, and I think that um, I really love this sermon. I, I, I don't know if it's in scripture, um, several different ones. Because one of the things I think in responding to His birth is, first of all, I think about it. What was the birth announcement? How, how do people, what was the response that, that you've had to birth announcements? I know y'all have had a lot all throughout your life. What are they? How have you responded to hearing a birth announcement? Happy. happy, excited, right? Anybody say anything? Fearful? <laughs> um, what else? Yeah, happy. What else? Right. 
think about the word overwhelmed sometimes too, right? <laughs> if you're a grandparent, you're like overwhelmed because, man, my kids, are they ready for this? Or if you're a parent, you're like, well, probably been the once in my life parent. Wow, that firstborn child, am I ready? <laughs> I'm overwhelmed, you know? Um, what about others, other words? Which are, how do you respond? How have you seen responses? I looked online last year and I was <clears throat> um, looking at stuff on YouTube and I looked at birth announcements and um, I thought it was pretty cool. There was a grandfather that unwrapped a present. I think it was around Christmas or something, whatever it was. And the, the, the response was he's in tears, not out of sadness, but out of joy. And he couldn't do anything but cry. So I'm like, I'm about to cry. So they're watching that. But it's just so, so neat to see these birth announcements. I think about this. And I think, how do we respond to who Jesus is? How do we respond to his birth? How do some people respond to his birth? And, and this morning, we're going to talk about, in our story today, in our story today, we're going to look at three, four different responses. And, and, and by the way, last week, last Sunday night was an awesome time. If you missed Sunday night, we broke down the sermon a little bit more and talked about it. And I plan to do the same thing just tonight. So I'd love for you guys to be here and take some notes this morning. And let's just talk about what God has done in our lives through this sermon. But four responses, four responses, the shepherds. We're going to look at them. We're going to look at Joseph and Mary. Then we're going to look at Herod. Wow, what, Herod? King Herod, yes. We're going to look at King Herod. King Herod, Matthew chapter 2, 1 through 12. We're going to look at what his response was to this baby. And you guys probably know this story. You've seen this story several times. You've read the Christmas story. If you're like my family, before we open the gifts, we know that we're going to read the Christmas story. And we're going to do it. We usually do it on Christmas Eve after a candlelight service. We'll go back. And we'll let them unwrap one present. But before we do that, we read the Christmas story. Um, after that Christmas Eve service as a family. But Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, I just want to read um, these verses, and then we're going to look at this. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star, in the east, and have come to worship him. As I looked at this, by the way, let me stop it real quick. As I looked at this, I got to thinking it transformed as more and more I looked at this story. You know, and this is not nowhere near it, but this kind of maybe it's an interjection, and I'll get back to it. Chase the rabbit. But if you think about the wise men, it took them a while to get to Jesus. It did it a couple of years. You know, he'd already been what about one or two years old. So, so here's what they they heard about this. And they have seen the star in the east and have come to worship him. And in verse 3, when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. And all Jerusalem with him. And when, I, when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So here Herod was. He was saying, where's this Christ to be born? I, need, I want you to tell me. I want you to find out. So he said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And then in verse 6 he says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. That's a quote, direct quote out of the Old Testament there. Um, from the, Actually from Micah, I believe. Who will shepherd my people. This is then Herod, verse 7, said, when he had secretly called the wise men and determined from them what time the star would appear. He secretly called, okay? Excuse me. <laughs> um, and sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. And when he, they heard the king, they departed, and behold, the star which they had seen in the east went over before them until it came and stood over where the child, young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. Well, 
couple things about this response. And what Herod's response was was not a really good response. He was troubled. That's what it says. He was troubled, right? He was fearful, right? In fact, you know what Herod was? He felt a threat to the throne. Herod was king, right? And he'd heard about this king of the Jews. In fact, out of Micah it says, But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. If you're a king and you hear somebody say, Out of the you shall come a ruler, you're feeling that threat, right? And that's what he felt. So you see, he came to him kind of saying, I just want to go visit. But really, in fact, in his mind, he was ready to kind of find him and kill him and do whatever he needed to do to get him out of the way. You know, the other thing I think that Herod did was he interfered. Well, um, he didn't like the fact that this King Jesus, this little baby, was coming and was going to, and he felt it was going to interfere with his life, his power, and his influences. See, you know, so he had hostility and hatred towards that one. You know, I think Herod had to learn something to learn. But I think we have to learn. We must let God interfere in our lives. We've got to let him. And, and, and we all know that. But even in our plans, and I'm planning out, we talked about plans last week. Talking about the architect, I can't say get throughout this this week. Why in the world is that coming back in my mind throughout the week? I'm sitting there going back, yeah, this would be a great plan. Wait a minute. You're the architect, God. I don't need to tell you what the plan is. You know the plan. And that's what I'm talking about there. Is it something here didn't learn, but we, we, I need to learn. We must let God interfere. Let him in. That's a good interference. Because he's the creator. He's the architect. He's the designer. He's the one that did that. Look at them. Talk about interference. Just a quick version. You don't have to go to it if you want, don't want to, but it's Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. This is almost like an interference here. Paul writes, but God, who is rich in mercy. And anytime you hear a but God, you think, you know, you, you've heard the kids say it, your grandkids say it, and they say, but, 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 no buts, right? You've always heard that growing up, and no, 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 not gonna happen. But here's what Paul says, because he was talking about all this stuff and early in chapter two about how we would look, used to live and all that. He said, but God, he interfered, who was rich in his mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses. But God sent his son to, as a little baby, Jesus, to be born rich in mercy. Made us alive together with Christ. I want those but God moments in my life. I want God to interfere in my life. Sometimes I don't. I'll tell you that. I'll sometimes have these conversations with God. Say, I'll say, I'll say, but God. But He needs to do that but again, you know. And He needs to kind of get my attention. And I think that's something that we need to all kind of take a, take a notice of. I think another guy, not only Herod, but another group of people were the shepherds. And some of you, many of you like the story, I know, of Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Um, we'll just look at the scriptures and kind of highlight some of the main things in there. But, but in Luke chapter 8, the, um, the, now there were in the same country, I love reading, by the way, the story of Jesus on Christmas Eve from Luke. Luke was a doctor. Luke was very, what does that mean? Luke was very detailed. And how he wrote things. And, and you'll find that this is a very detailed um, um, story of Jesus here. Now there, now there, verse 8. Now there in the same country were shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord sto stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And imagine when you got a group of guys that were shepherding their flock. At night, and I'm a little fearful at night if I'm standing out in the dark, dark by myself too. You know, I'm just wanting to grab, just grab my gun or something you know, because I don't want to be kind of around there. But all of a sudden you see this light you've never seen before, okay? I want you to put your mindset in this if you never have, because I think 
thank God the Lord allows us to do this. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before him, and the glory of the Lord shone around him, and they were greatly afraid. Someone said they were sore afraid. I hear the, I hear the little kid, what is it, the, the Christmas pageant thing? They were sore afraid. That little kid saying that, they were sore afraid. They were greatly afraid. And then the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with a, the angel of a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward men. Verse 15, so it is was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem. And they said, let us go. You know what? I was afraid. But now I hear all this. You, if you heard this, it would do what to you? It would, it would stoke your curiosity, right? It's almost like we always heard curiosity kills, kills the cat. Sometimes a curious George, you ever heard of that story? You know, curious George always wanted to kind of find out what's going on. That's what the shepherds were. They said, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that come to pass which the Lord has known, made known to us. Here's the responses. They were first terrified. They were scared to death. They were shaken. They saw this light. The other thing is, I think they were curious. They were curious after that because they said, let us go. They were curious to observe, to experience, and to confirm. I think, uh, not that those three different words are any important except for the fact of this. They were curious. They wanted to find out for themselves. They wanted to say, let's go see if this thing, see if this thing's come to pass, which was made known to us by the Lord. Let's experience it. You know, if you know about sheep, and you know, obviously when they're out in their flock by night, it's in the spring kind of night, morning, evening, I think. And uh, where the green grass is, and that's kind of where they go. And they got to be careful for wolves, because wolves can come, whatever. They got to watch their sheep. But they wanted to experience something different. And then they wanted to confirm if this is true. So that was their reaction. You know, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 5 21, but test all things, hold to what is good. And then we look at Psalms 34 8, it says, taste, taste, and see that the Lord is good. God tells us all the time, taste and see that I'm good. Guess what? If you taste him, if you truly taste, if you really see him, you're going to know he's good. We already heard this testimony of the praises in here, right? He has been good. He's good to me all the time, right? Taste and see that the Lord is good. A group of people, and I've got the shepherds still, I want us to continue to look at, but also look at Mary. You know, Mary is, a, is one that um, we don't want to forget about or, or look, overlook. Um, Luke 2, back in that same passage, 19 and 20. But Mary kept all these things. Because here's what happened. The shepherds came. Just to finish the story at verse 16. They came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know, it's almost like a mother. That's what she was. She was a mother. You know how mothers do. They ponder these things in their heart. They get all this stuff. Mary was just keeping it all in there and just pondered it. And then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God. For all the things they heard and seen as it was told them. And I think in, um, and I just want to, I'm going to, let's just look at the, first of all, the shepherds again. We saw that they were, they were fearful. We saw that they were curious. I think another thing we saw in their response, because after they saw this baby Jesus, what did they do? They returned praising and worshiping God. Because, you know, Acts chapter 4 says, I think Paul was told, Paul, was it Paul and Silas? Was it Paul, um, I think, anyway, his companions, 
they were in jail. Uh, but they were about, they were, they were, you know, they were between jail, and they were, they were actually being asked to not talk anymore, or else. And what did Paul say? We cannot keep, was it, no, it was Peter, I'm sorry. Was it, I, I better go to that. Acts chapter 4. <laughs> um, Acts chapter 4. With the boldness of um, said, what did they say? They said, um, whether it's right for you or not for us to keep quiet, it's fine for you, but what we see and heard, we can't keep quiet. And that's the reason why I even shared that scripture. Like I said before, scripture interprets scripture. I want to share the story again. I didn't even have it in my notes, but I thought about this. I said, the shepherds couldn't stop glorifying and praising what they saw. Their response, like, when they saw Jesus, when Peter saw what they'd seen and heard, they couldn't stop glorifying what they saw. And I'm telling you, this is a joyful time of the year. It shouldn't be just a, this year, this time of the year, it should be all time. The church should not stop glorifying and praising what they've seen and heard and they've experienced and confirmed in their hearts Jesus Christ. See, look for one, chapter 1, verse 46. Mary's song. I do want us to read this. I think it's a, a beautiful song. The song of Mary is what it's called. And it's kind of, really, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a hymn. A magnificent hymn that magnifies um, what God has done for her. This is kind of her response. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. We do. I mean, we, we do. For who is mighty has done great things for me. But obviously we know she was just a servant girl, right? She was not really, we don't worship Mary. But we call her blessed as it's being used as a tool by God to bring the Savior of the world to earth as a baby. And he could have brought that Savior of the world any other way he wanted to, but he chose that way. For who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And as his mercy is on those who fear me from generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mad and mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly, and he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Mary remained with her about three months in return. Return to her. And this is kind of the song that she had. I see in here three things, three revolutions, three changes. Revolutions just change. I see a moral revolution, I see a social revolution, and I see an economic revolution. In fact, I can't claim it's mine as I was doing some studying that. I found that and thought that was really neat to share. And I've looked at it more. But in verse 51 of chapter 1, we see he has shown strength with his mercy, his arm, and he scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Moral revolution. What in the world does that mean? He broke down the pride. There is none. He humbled us. He, the king of kings came to lay at a feeding trough. I'm just going to say, that's what it is. Oh, no. He, he did that on purpose to break down the pride. He said, there's no pride. I came. I am the king of kings. But I came this way. Because I want to show... He wants to show us the way. Did God intervene? Mary knew it was all God. She knew it was all God. His grace, his glory, his power. In Psalms chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, I'll just read that. I'll go to that real quick.
Solomon says, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. This is talking about the triumph of the kingdom, the Messiah's triumph. I looked at this last show over there and I said, what in the world does this mean? Does that mean God laughs? Let's continue to read. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision, and then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. What I think that means, what I see that means, is he laughs at our wrath. He laughs at our struggles of trying to be what we want to be. He laughs at all that. Not in a mockery way, but he says, you know what? I'm the king of kings. I'm the one who came to be the savior of the world. And he says, I'm breaking down the bonds in pieces, and I'm casting away their cords. And he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. We see a moral revolution in verse 51. Verse 52, we see a social revolution. She says, Mary says, He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. She broke down all labels. I mean, when Jesus broke down all labels, sorry, among humanity. It means there's no white, black, Chinese, Mexican. There's no labels like that. We're all one. Broke down all labels. What does it say? All oppression in his sight. This is what the little song said in kids' song, right? Broke down all labels. That's, that's Jesus' word. This is God's word right here. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the Lord. There's no love. And, and not just that, but also he broke down the labels of, of class and economic or rich or poor or whatever. He broke down all those labels. To realize that. You know, my king, as a little baby, laying in a manger, there's nothing we can put labels on us either. God came in the most humble state. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, and Shadrach, and all those, who thought he was so brilliant, but eventually he lost his sanity. He went crazy. <laughs> it took what for him to get back? For God to restore him. It took him to repent. It took him to turn to God and say, you know, I'm afraid of this is not whatever. You think about that and say, that's what it is. We can do everything we can on our own, but we're going to realize we may lose it. I hope we don't lose it, Sandy. We may end up being there. It's going to drive us crazy trying to become like what we want until we become what Jesus did and what he set aside saying, you know what? This is how it is. The other thing is, he saw, or she talked about, in Luke 53 of chapter 2, he has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. I would say an economic revolution. Uh, the revolution just changed. It's just changed. In other words, what it means is my work, my accomplishments, which, if you look at my house, look what I got, I don't want like nothing. I don't have anything. I am a preacher. Huh? <laughs> I, didn't go to, I didn't go to ministry to get rich, right? But what Christ did is he said, he filled the hunger with good things. My work, my accomplishments, my status, my stuff doesn't matter. Yeah, it's good to have stuff. I mean, it's, it's great to find that stuff. But you know what? It's not something I need. Do you see your need? He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich has sent away empty. So we see that Herod responded in fear, and he was troubled in his heart, really kind of from a fact of saying that I'm threatened, feel threatened from on my throne. Uh, you know, I'm got this high and mighty position, and I'm afraid somebody's going to take it. The shepherds, um, Kind of the original were terrified, but they went and took care of us, and then they left praising God. 
And Mary, Mary responded with this beautiful song of saying that she pondered these things in her heart and realizing that he, he, you know, he had her being. Um, they broke all pride. Um, they broke down all labels. And everything that, 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 that she had accomplished, everything that we have accomplished, the status that we've had, but it doesn't really matter in comparison to God, Christ. Now, those are great. Don't get me wrong. God wants us to do the best we can with what we got. He does. But we realize that in, in perspective of Him. How will you serve the King of Kings this year? That's a question we should all ask. Should we, you know, it's something to think about, and we're looking at how even Mary did. You know, Psalms 102 and 3, this is another, this is, says, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him singing with joy. Acknowledge the Lord is good. Mary worshipped him. The shepherds worshipped him. The shepherds were praising him. You know, I love the scripture. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 and 40. Well, it, or 39. You see, the, the, Jesus was talking to the disciples and the disciples were asking, they were asking this question. Teacher, tell us what the first, law, first laws are, the laws of the prophets. One of the great commandments what they ask. Jesus didn't tell them, well, see, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not. No, Jesus said this, he went straight to this. Really, the, the Torah he went to, was it, was it the in De Deuteronomy 6? He went to the what the what little children will learn as they're growing up back in the Jewish days, the Jewish children. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, I think that's the kind of attitude that Mary had. I think that's the kind of attitude that shepherds responded to. You know, and even kind of continuing with Mary, but adding Joseph in this picture, I want us to look at one more passage that's, that's kind of dealing with these in Matthew chapter 1. And it's, and it's so neat to look at different Gospels. They are Matthew, Mark, Luke, or Synoptic, which is same, means they're same. But they... they they're eyewitness accounts. It's almost like if I walked out the door at the same time Richard walked out the door, we both saw an accident. I'd probably report it away differently than he would report it. And this is how we see somewhat some of these gospels accounts are. You know, and then realizing that that, that these guys kind of like like said, Luke was a medical doctor. So Luke's gonna help look at details. He's going to look at things like that. Matthew was over here. And he's looking at other things. And looking at other eyewitness accounts. So we all look at it differently. It's almost like when you're painting a house or a wall. I think about this this past week. And you think you saw everything that, that you missed on the, that wall. But then somebody comes in and says, well, there's a spot there and there's a spot there and there's a spot there. It's, it's those the little details of things. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 in 25, it says, and it still talks about the birth of Jesus, but this is really uh, from Joseph's perspective. So Joseph said, um, the birth of Jesus Christ was, was as follows, after his mother Mary were betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found a child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, you know, and, and, and they were called, they called engaged or betrothed, and we all know what the betrothal time that time, man. We we look at engagement like it could be easily broken up. And I've known teen, young people. I was a college minister in the church recent uh, a couple of years ago, several years ago, whatever. And a uh, young adult minister, and I had a young guy that, that was engaged with a girl and broke it off, and then engaged with a girl and broke it off. And I don't know if they're still together or not. So you use that example and seeing that. But just, we look at that as not like they used to. They lived at betrothal and engagement as almost really married. But they did, obviously they didn't consummate the marriage until the final act of ceremony was there and they were married. But they were really considered that. That's why most Joseph and Mary were going to pay their taxes or, or for the census, for the census and stuff. So um, together, then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make her public, a public example, 
was reminded, reminded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take you, take you Mary, to take you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and she will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done, and that it might be fulfilled. And then Joseph, verse 24, says, being aroused from his sleep, did it as the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took him to his wife. Took him, took, took him to his wife, and did not know her still. So, you know, Joseph had planned to divorce her secretly, you know, not to do it publicly. He was kind of afraid. What in the world would the world think? He's kind of concerned, you know, he's like, what in the world would the world think? And here I've got this, this culture, this, this world, I've got this, I'm just going to be my wife. And she's pregnant. But, you know, and Mary, you know, Mary was, we, we've already read this passage, but Mary was kind of troubled by the news. She was questioning, how can this occur? How in the world can this occur? I'm not being with a man. That's what she was saying. But then, what did Joseph, what did the final thing in Matthew chapter 1 say? Joseph trusted in God's plan. He went ahead and took her as his wife. He was obedient to God. Mary said, nothing is impossible with God. Trust in God's plan as a servant. You know, I think we can be obedient, we can understand it, decide to and realize nothing's impossible with God. God is still in control. He's on the throne. No matter what's happening in our world today, we serve a Jesus, a Christ that, is, that was born several thousand years ago in a manger that's still in control and still, I mean, if he wasn't, it would be mass chaos right now. I understand this. He's still in control. That's pretty awesome to see and recognize. So how will we display obedience to God? That's Christmas, maybe among our families. How will we display that? How will we display, because sometimes many of us have that opportunity to be with our families one time a year. Maybe it's two times a year. But maybe how will we just display that obedience even tomorrow? If Philippians says, don't be selfish, don't try to impress others, don't, you know, be humble. He says, be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. It really says, have the same attitude as Christ Jesus in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Um, at the close. One, another wonderful hymn about really the humanity of Jesus and, 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 and the things that we see here. But it says in verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. So his mindset was, I don't have a reputation, I'm not going to make a reputation. You know, I, I struggle with that because I want people to know me, right? I want people to know about me or know where I'm at or whatever. But you know, Jesus says, let this, Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He took on the form of a bond. It never says here that he laid, he, he stopped being, being God. It never says that he stopped being fully God. What it says is he took on the bond servant. The form of a monster, the coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. The king of kings humbled himself, became obedient unto death. He knew he was coming as a baby to be killed one day for our sins. That was the purpose. That was, that was the plan. That was, he knew that. that. That was not a surprise to him. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Now, the name of Jesus, that he knew he should bow. And 
of those in heaven and those on earth and of those on earth. Hopefully, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Hopefully, that maybe this Christmas, when we get together with families, maybe we should try to proclaim his name. <coughs> every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. See, Jesus, his attitude was he humbled himself. He took the position of a servant which is not common in this world today. <laughs> not common. We work today in any kind of jobs we have or wherever we've been, we go anywhere, and it's not common. We watch the media, watch TV. Born as a human. Took on human flesh, but, um, but yet a perfect human. And became obedient to God the Father. So how will you respond? Will it be for fear, like Herod? Will it be curiosity? Maybe some of us are, maybe our family members, maybe those around us are kind of curious about this Jesus thing and really don't know. They just hear it all the time. They go to church services because they're, they're CEOs, they're Christmas, Easter only people. And so they're always going to step in the doors during a Christmas service or whatever. So they're curious. But maybe they, maybe, maybe we responded with worship. And worship doesn't mean that you should play music. We worship today without, without any kind of instruments. That's worship. Worship is living their lives. For God. Responding out of obedience. Well, I don't know what that means for us. I don't know what that means for me necessarily for tomorrow either. But what is it to be obedient to God? What needs to change in order for me to respond well to the name of Jesus? You know, Paul said again, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God. He brought us back to himself through Christ, through this baby Jesus. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. But God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. No longer counting people's sins against him, and he gave us the wonderful message of reconciliation. Today, we still can have an opportunity just to respond to God and and this, that, I just want us to bow our heads and close our eyes um, and just, and just think, think alone. I, mean, I think alone time is good to be alone with God. And I think that, um, what did you say, I think? Fear? Curiosity? What was it? It was fear, curiosity. It was um, responding out of um, worship, obedience, those things. How about responding to the birth? Is there somebody around me that maybe be just curious, so curious? Maybe there's someone more fear me. But this could be our invitation right here. We don't have to go down front. We don't have to do anything. Just think about what God is doing in your life. And what God is doing. Because I'm going to ask you to do something after we pray and be done and to commit to something. To really think about, well, and we're going to try to make a beautiful service for families, but we would like to invite some others um, to Christmas Eve. But first, let's think about this. Are you responding to God in the right way? I mean, how can you lead other people to respond to God? It's a moment of silence. Let's spend some time with God. Lord, this morning we um, all across this congregation here at Orange give an opportunity to you. And I, I think it's so awesome to know that the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, you are, um, are hearing prayers from everywhere. And you can take them all in. And Father, we ask you, Lord, to give those hearts that are pouring out to you right now. Some may be saying, you know what, I'm fearing some things, God. I'm curious. Or, or uh, you know, I, I, I worship. Um, 
I want to respond in a better attitude of worship to you. Some of you pray for someone they know at work or family or in the community that need to respond in a better way than you and your brother. Someone they may have known in their the life in this church that hadn't been here, that they know about, they've seen them throughout the weeks, and they just need to know. So, Father, we ask you, Lord, to, to be with us. Thank you, Lord, that you were able and you saw fit to send your little, your son as a little baby to be the Savior of the world. Like the song goes, it's just, it seems like a strange gift, but an awesome gift to be able to say, the King of Kings. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, lives with me. Father, we thank you for who you are. We love you in your name we pray. Amen. You know, we, um, I did something this week, and I hope it's okay. I, I thought, well, I'm going to give y'all a tool. I got a lot of these, so if we want to get rid of them, whatever, but I don't know if, um, how we're going to pass them out, but 